Hi, this is Mohamed Omer and Manos Brulakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, presenting case 100 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This is the fourth case illustrating how multiple challenges have to be overcome to achieve final success in complex PCI. The patient had complex previous medical history. He had chronic kidney disease with GFR around 40, significant PAD with multiple previous revascularization procedures in the lower extremities, as well as significant coronary disease with a PCI of the left main 13 years prior and coronary bypass graft surgery 10 years prior with lima to LAD and sequential vein graft to the right posterior lateral and the right posterior descending artery. Diagnostic angiogram was done using left common femoral axis that was fairly challenging to obtain. We can see there are all the stents in the external iliac artery. Eventually, angiogram was performed, demonstrating significant disease in the proximal circumflex as well as the proximal LAD. The LAD is occluded in the mid-segment, however, there is a large septal branch arising from the LAD supplying the PDA that appears to be occluded. We can see a little better the left-sided lesions. Again, there's proximal LAD disease, proximal circumflex disease, and there is disease in the first obtuse marginal branch that we can see a little bit better on this segment. So focal disease here, significant disease into the circumflex and the proximal LAD. And we can see the old stents from the previous PCI procedure 13 years prior. The Lima to LAD was patent with good flow, and the right coronary artery was occluded, as was the vein graft to the right coronary artery, bringing us to the question about what should be the target lesion. This patient had uh, severe symptoms despite maximal medical therapy, so clearly revascularization was required. Coronary bypass for the second time is most of the time not a good option, especially when the Lima is patent, as was the case in our patient. Therefore, the decision was made to perform PCI on the left, the rationale being that the right coronary CTO had been present for many years, but the patient has only had symptoms more recently, and there appeared to be progression in the disease on the left system compared with before. We obtained a left common femoral axis, similar to before, however, we were unable to advance a micropuncture dilator kit over the micropuncture guide wire. And this can happen sometimes in vessels where that have been accessed several times. In this case, there's probably a lot of scar tissue from the previous coronary and peripheral revascularization procedures. Moreover, when we were trying to advance the microcatheter dilator, there was kinking in the subcutaneous tissue, something that is critical to appreciate before trying to advance more equipment because this can lead to loss of guide wire position and significant bleeding. So we're at step number 10, getting the micropuncture dilator inside the vessel. This is usually goes smooth. However, even if it goes okay, it is important to perform fluoroscopy because sometimes, although the tip may seem to be on the skin, it is possible that there is some coiling or some kinking inside the subcutaneous tissue. This is another example of the same problem. So how to overcome this problem? We have here the micropuncture wire appears to be kinked. One option is to pull it back if we have enough left inside the vessel, cut it out, and use either a new micropuncture dilator kit or the dilator from a radial sheath to go back in and then uh, uh, switch for an O35 wire and insert the sheath. In this particular case, the way we solve the problem is by inserting the inner dilator of the micropuncture kit that actually went over the micropuncture wire. Then we remove the micropuncture wire and inserting a long platinum plus, 18 thousandths of an inch wire, that is stiff. And over this one, we were able to advance the microcatheter and then switch for an amplage super stiff guide wire that enabled placement of a sheath through the previously placed iliac stents. We then perform right heart catheterization to determine the need for hemodynamic support given the complexity of the procedure. However, the patient's wedge pressure was only four, therefore a decision was made to not use hemodynamic support. 
The problem though was when trying to remove this one, there was uh, a knot created at the mid segment due to multiple manipulations that were needed to advance it into the wedge position. We tried to pull it out, but actually the knot uh, came to the sheath and could not be removed. So how to solve this problem? And of course we haven't even started yet the PCI. The, what we did is we readvanced the knot, the swan, back into the vessel and then tried to advance the stiff platinum plus wire through the uh, swan. Eventually, after coming further up, we were able to bring it back. There was still a king, but eventually, by counterclocking, we were able to release the king and straighten out the swan and then remove the cafter back out. We are trying to get to the aorta and we had significant difficulty getting past the distal aorta due to probably significant disease and calcium. So we used a woolly wire that is very soft tip and that went up into the aorta. Engaging was also challenging. However, we were finally able to advance the back end of uh, the stiff guide wire to straighten out the EBU guide and then the guide was able to engage the left main. What should be the procedural plan here? We know we have previously placed stents, we know we have significant calcification, we know we have another significant lesion in the first obtuse marginal branch. Our plan here was to first treat that OM lesion before tackling the bifurcation, then use multiple high pressure balloon inflations to see if we can expand it, use intravascular imaging, and determine the need of stenting at the end. So we successfully stented the obtuse marginal lesion without any challenges. But then we had a lot of difficulty dilating the circumflex. The lesion was uh, um, hard to expand despite using multiple high pressure balloon inflations, including non-compliant as well as the chocolate balloon. We did also multiple kissing balloon inflations in the late in the circumflex, but once again, there remained significant disease. We did intravascular ultrasound to better understand the anatomy. Coming back, there is an old stand, and then there is heavy calcification. Coming back all the way to the uh, left main. So we have a heavily calcified vessel that is hard to expand with previously placed stents. We did uh, a physiologic assessment to see whether our balloon inflations were good enough. However, the DPR on uh, the obtuse marginal branch was 0.76, with the step up being right at the proximal circumflex. Therefore, we clearly had a residual disease in the proximal circumflex. How to overcome this problem? We do have uh, a lot of tools to treat calcified lesions like this one, including non-compliant balloons, which we tried. Plaque modification balloons, which we tried the chocolate, did not work. Atherectomy, orbital or rotational intravascular lithotripsy and high, the very high pressure balloon. Lithotripsy for the coronary is not yet approved in the United States. However, the peripheral catheter can be used off-label in the coronaries if it can be delivered. And this is the algorithm for instant balloon and dilatable lesions. The first step is high pressure inflations, which we did. The second is to use uh, various plaque modification balloons, which we also did. The third step usually is to use laser with contrast, followed by a therectomy if that fails. However, in this case, we decided to use off-label the intravascular lithotripsy balloon, which actually delivered through the lesion a 3.0 by 40 millimeter peripheral shockwave balloon, and then uh, 80 pulses uh, were given. And after doing that, we were actually able to finally expand the balloon into the circumflex. Of course, more problems had to happen. So actually here, we did have a proximal edge dissection. We had a left main dissection, likely from the high pressure balloon inflations. So this was treated, placing an additional 4.0 by 8 millimeter Zion's recoluting stand, taken up to 4.5 with an 8 millimeter non-compliant balloon. And we performed intravascular ultrasound to check our result 
and confirm that there was good expansion of the stent, which was the case, and also to confirm that we had covered the left main ostium, and this is shown nicely in this image, this is the left main ostium, we can see that the stent is protruding into the aorta, there is flow around the stent, so clearly we have covered the ostium of the left main. And this was the final result, with an excellent expansion of the circumflex as well as the LAD. We actually did not place additional stents in either the circumflex or the, or the LAD. We only placed the stent into the obtuse marginal as well as the left main. We did use 110 ml of contrast, a little more than we would like to use. Our absolute limit is four times the GFR, which would be about 160, so we're still below that, but ideally we should um, try to keep the, low, the contrast volume as low as possible. Several lessons from this case is um, the need to overcome serial problems. The first one was the inability to advance the micropuncture dilator. One solution is to get the inner dilator in first, get a stiff 018 guide wire like the Platinum Plus, and then use that uh, to insert uh, the micropuncture kit and then a stiff wire to obtain access. Second, when a knot is created in the swan, the important thing is to not pull. Instead, the therapy is to push the swan back in and then use a stiff wire to straighten it out, turn it the opposite direction than the one it was originally turned into, which typically is clockwise, and then try to take the knot out before pulling it out. Third lesson is about the treatment of balloon and dilatable lesions. Intravascular lithotripsy can provide an answer and was very useful in our case with a previously placed underexpanded stents. Fourth, in cases of left main dissection, the answer is stenting, ensuring that the ostium is covered, which was ensured using intravascular ultrasound. And fifth, using of intravascular ultrasound to check the PCI result, as well as coronary physiology, can help optimize the outcome and also reduce the use of contrast. Thank you.